but it's not. It's about teamwork from every level, whether it be a receptionist, support staff, paralegal staff, the team of fee earners around us, and so on. So it's about getting that message across, and it's been a pleasure working with the Academy to introduce them into our business and for us to have ambassadors, people coming in here to do those interviews. So what makes the ideal employee? It's hard work, but it's also teamwork. It's hugely important for people to recognise that because it's all about being a cog in that. And that enthusiasm that needs to come across, motivation and friendliness. And it may seem like the most obvious thing to say, but it's so... Um, so often the case that we're dealing with people that are coming through education that are just striving for academic ability and achievement and so on. But for us, especially when we're sifting through candidates, we are looking for people that can bring that personal attitude, that I'm going to give this a go, and above all, that are willing to learn, listen, take some criticism, and to educate themselves. So from that point of view, it's not just about being the best by any means at all. And from that, uh, you know, teamwork was illustrated certainly last year when we were part with the Academy with, um, for those that were there, the most amazing performance of Joseph. Looking around those students that day and coming to performances over the years and seeing the, the music, the teamwork, the working together, whether it be those that were dealing with the costumes, back room, or handing out tickets or dealing with that, absolutely astonishing. And those sort of things going into an application, showing employers and universities what they've been involved in I think impresses us as an employer um, a significant, a great deal more than just having straight qualifications. So from that point of view, encouraging and having employees um, and young people that feel, yeah, we can, we can bring something to this. We might have a small role, but, we, but that's part of the success of a business, whatever the industry is. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, Shazman. So as Mike said, um, you need that drive to like succeed. And I believe that Milton Keynes Academy actually gives you that opportunity to actually develop those skills. Um, for instance, when I was doing Young Enterprise last year, um, I was the managing director. So I had to learn how to actually do all those skills. Um, when I was in the trade fair at Middleton Hall, I was offered a job by Sky Sports only because my communication skills were like at their level and they were looking for someone which was hardworking and was able to communicate. So Milton Keynes Academy does give you that development to go on to employment, as in my perspective. It gives you that foundation to go the extra mile. Excellent. Thank you, Shazman. Debbie, would you like to respond? Yes. Can I just p uh, pick up on what Shazman's just said? Um, when she got the job offer from Sky Sports, she was actually, she'd been ill for three days and she epitomizes can-do attitude. She carried her team on that day and was a real credit to the academy and has been ever since. So it was, you know, a, a beautiful example of the, the, of resilience. Um, what does make an ideal, um, employee? It's, um, a question that we've, asked ourselves quite a lot over the last couple of years and this is one of the reasons why we are doing the business engagement strategy trying to put forward the employability charter um, we know that we need to work in partnership with um, businesses local businesses they tell us what they need and hopefully we can respond and we can prepare our students um, by uh, the employability skills that we teach in the academy for their next step, whether it's onto an education establishment or whether it's into employment. Lovely. Thank you, Debbie. Tom, I can ask you to respond um, and your thoughts with regards to that, uh, uh, the answers you've heard. I thought it was really well answered. I think she nailed it on the head with how the academy drives its students. It was very well answered. Good, thank you for that. Yes, it certainly, from, from my perspective, it, uh, there's an awful lot done that uh, wasn't done in my day, but then that's a long time ago, so we'll move on. Um, I would like to ask Ali. He has a question for us. Ali, where are you? Ah, oh, there we are. Um, employers tell us that schools, school leavers do not, have, do not wish to take jobs in construction, engineering, and IT. Is this true, and if so, why? Okay, JY, would you like to kick off on that one? Uh, yeah, I think one of the main reasons is because there's like a quite a large skill gap. 
uh, mainly in schools, we're taught ICT and us using uh, Excel and uh, spreadsheets and just uh, you know the basic IT skills need to use in the workplace. Whereas uh, workers are, are looking for uh, more technical uh, IT workers, and I don't think that's really taught in school much. I have a friend who uh, he he knows a lot about computers and coding, and it's only because his family does it, and his and his dad taught him, and his older brother taught him coding and computing. And uh, it's not really taught in schools much, so there's not many people with the skills out there to take jobs in IT and engineering. So I think that's the the main issue there. That's why there's not many people out there willing to take jobs in uh, that sector of business. Okay, that's an interesting perspective. John, would you like to respond to that, please? Yeah, I think I think some of it's how how some sectors are are perceived. Um, take construction, you know, classically that's seen as you know, a male-dominated industry, and many sort of females don't necessarily lean towards that type of work, and and that's for us as a school and indeed the community to sort of break down those those cliches and to offer um, opportunities within those areas. And Jay was correct in saying there is a bit of a skills gap um, for some of the things, and and we are trying to address that. I mean, taking your point about computing versus IT lower down the school now the children learn computing and do computer science which is about coding and creating apps whereas some of the older children still do the the IT uh, qualification which isn't that so trying to address the skills gap is is really important for us um taking engineering you know we're, we're not a, a college that's got massive facilities for engineering but a lot of the engineering skills are are done through other subjects, design technology, for example. And there's lots of extracurricular projects around around that too. But it's trying to get more and more people in, involved and, and to show the worth. And in this country, there's still a perception that some some vocational routes are, are not not as good as an academic route compared to, say, countries like Germany. And, and that's something very difficult to change overnight. But it's something that we're very keen about. Um, Within the engineering side, uh, trying to address the skills gap, a school does do a lot of projects, people like Network Rail with Nifty Lift, um, and particularly trying to get girls into engineering projects with Nissan as well. So a lot does go on, um, but again, not, it's not just bridging the skills gap, it's about perceptions of some of these, these areas, and, and that's where the jobs are, ultimately, and, and very, very good jobs too. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yes, before we move on to Jess, who I'm sure has got lots to say about this, um, isn't it true you mentioned the word perception? I mean, that's, that's, that's very true. If, if students are saying to, to employees that uh, um, they're not interested in that area, then is it about their perception of, of engineering because of the, the fact that it, it, it tends to be viewed as in decline, even though it's not and it's thriving? Mm. Um, is it maybe a case of um, people looking at... Um, aspects of learning and not necessarily equating it to engineering or construction. Can I get your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's, it's combinations of all those sort of things. I mean, I'm looking at some of our staff here absolutely sort of passionate about, about the engineering side of things. And I think there is a perception that, that engineering is about, you know, dirty jobs and, you know, getting literally dirty and, and sweaty and the rest of it. And, and obviously it's a lot more than that. And that does put people off. And it's very much our job to, to educate people that Engineering is a lot more than that, and there are hundreds and hundreds of jobs within the engineering sector. And as you're, you've rightly said, it's it's a huge growth industry, particularly in this part of the world as well. Um, yeah. Okay. Jess, can we have your thoughts, please? Yeah, I've just got um, a few points to say on this, actually. Um, the first is obviously bridging that gap um, between the subjects that you study at school and then how you can apply them in the workplace. And I think that's where it comes to the employers getting involved with the school and... I mean, the, the mission of this whole setup is to get employees involved and speak to the students and figure out their niche su subject and how they can take that subject and passion and apply it in the workplace and where where they can go with the subjects they're studying. Um, so yeah, it is about bridging the gap, um, I think, big time. And the second point as well, actually, is um, overcoming the stereotypical engineering look and feel, like John said, and. Um, having employees get involved doing workplace visits and showing the students firsthand, I think, is really important to try and 
overcome that stereotypical image. Um, so, and and the one one thing from Nifty Lift's point of view, we've we had an overwhelming amount of applications this year for apprenticeships, which is fantastic. We've had over a hundred, and um, so there's no shortfall in, in student school leavers applying for jobs in engineering from our point of view. But um, one one area that we want to overcome, like John said, is females in engineering, and that's one of our focuses at the moment is trying to encourage young girls to realise that it's not just a male-dominated environment, and that actually there are jobs out there for young female engineers to get involved with. Um, so we are really pushing that. We're holding a Women in Engineering Day coming up next week, and we are trying to encourage as many students in Milton Keynes to be involved with that. And the final point is, actually, we aren't just an engineering company. There are so many different aspects within the company. There are everything from finance, marketing, sales. There are so many different roles that make an engineering company happen and make it a success. So it's not all just about engineering. Okay, thank you. It's a, it's a long time coming, um, <clears throat> females in engineering. Um, I, I have to confess that in 1976, when I started my engineering apprenticeship, um, there was a young lady on the, um, as an apprentice, and she was the first, nationally, the first lady. Um, and, uh, and I thought, well, this is good, it's opening up the gate, but it's taken a few, t a few years to, to really make an impact, but uh, nonetheless, things are happening, that's good. Um, so, Ali, could you give me your thoughts on um, what you've heard? What, what, uh, what are your thoughts? Good. Okay. I, th I think it is all about um, a lot about perception, and uh, I, I think schools and employers um, can do um, a lot to, to help with this perception. Because if this is what school leavers are saying, um, then it's the, the, they believe it to be true. So, uh, and of course, it isn't true. So we need to do something about changing that perception. <clears throat> Thank you very much, all. Um, Owen. Owen has a question for us. Um, I'd just like to ask, uh, what are the barriers to industry and education working more closely together and where can, what can be done to improve them where we are? Okay, thank you very much. Debbie, I think you would be the, a good one to start on this one. Okay, well thank you for that. So, um, barriers to industry and education working together. Um, for a long time, perhaps too long, um, we've been seen in different silos. But one of the reasons that we've started the um, business engagement strategy is to break down those barriers. What we want to do is to engage with employers, to engage with community um, associations, to give our students the skills that they need for their next steps. Now, Jess has just mentioned bridging the gap. Well, we have a classic example of one of our Year 11 students who's just been accepted at Nifty Lift on an advanced craft apprenticeship. We're very, very proud of him um, because we, he is a superb candidate, but I also think because of our relationship, we were able to prepare that student. We knew what Nifty Lift were looking for. That particular student had been involved in lots of different cross-curricular activities, had entered competitions, had been mentored by staff who'd taken particular interest in him, seen his potential, and with the help of Nifty Lift, have actually ensured a, a very, very happy future. Fingers crossed. Um, now... That's bridging the gap. That's actually creating pathways. This is um, the path, the mission that we're on is very much about supporting our students, giving them the tools that they need. We talk to employers like Jess and Mike to find out the best way of doing that. Now, we know in this uh, wonderful institution of Milton Keynes Academy, we know we're doing a lot of really good work already. Um, what we have to make sure is that students understand that what they're learning in English or maths, or science, um, is actually directly transferable to the world of work. And for us to be able to make those links. Um, this week we had um, E.C. Harris coming in and they work with the whole of our Year 7 group. 
they were working in English, doing English skills, but very much. Um,